Today is April 11th, 1995, and I am speaking again with Lois Gumpert at her home in Bend. We're continuing our conversation about her experiences in the transporting logging railroad community of Shevlin uh, with the Shevlin Hickson Company. This is tape number six of the Shevlin Hickson Brook Scanlon Oral History Project. My name is Ron Gregory, and the tape belongs to me. You were commenting that you had been a postmistress. Oh. Now, can you tell me about that? What, yes. what, what, how long was that in which camp? Or camp? La Pine. La Pine. Well, I started in La Pine. Okay. And uh, uh, Bill Bear had been the postmaster. Uh, um, he had uh, the uh, he was the clerk and the timekeeper, and um, so uh, in this this also was building up on the wheels, and um, so in the front part of his office they partitioned it, and uh, that was the post office. So uh, Bill bought um, uh, a pool hall and bend moved, so. Um, I took his place, and I was just 21, and then so um, I hadn't even voted yet, but, <laughs> but maybe you don't want to hear all this. Stuff. No, go right ahead. Well, uh, the um, you became postmaster by actually it's a political job at that point, and uh, I had never voted, so I, the Democrats were in office, so I registered the Democrats. And then you have to take a, a civil service exam, and uh, if you have competition and if they are a service person, they get 10 points added to their score, so they get first preference. Right. Well, anyway, I... Uh, made the grade, and I became a postmaster. And I, uh, about that time, um, well, soon after that, the, the post office was to move. Let's see which camp were we in now, and I became a postmaster, but they then applying, yeah. And they were moving down the summit, which was uh, between the pine and, you know, where it is. Well, anyway, about a year, uh, we knew we'd be moving the next year, so I started writing to the uh, postal department to get permission to move my office. Well, they had never, never had a post office or wanted to move clear out of the county. You know, they either go down the street a block or something like that. So this went on, writing and writing and telling them all I could. Well, they had to know an exact hour this was going to happen because it would mean changing the mail route and uh, nobody knew that they wouldn't know it even until a day before maybe what day the post office would be moved <laughs> in, the, in the meantime they had built a special building a separate building for the post office moved it out of the main office so uh, I had visions of sitting down there on the highway waiting for the um, <laughs> in the post office and all the people gone this <laughs> means but that didn't happen they finally realized the situation and, and let me move it was this a, a problem that occurred each time you moved well that's the only time I moved oh okay mm -hmm. all right so from you were the the postmaster uh, from the Lapine camp to the summit Mm -hmm. And but then not at, at Shamalt. No, I don't know who was postmaster down there. I guess they still had it. Well, you had mentioned that uh, Bill Bear had been the clerk and timekeeper. Uh, Clint had mentioned that his dad, Clint uh -huh. uh, Olson Senior, had been a, a timekeeper. Time also, keeper. well, he worked in the office too. But and then uh, when Bill left, why uh, Clint? was a girl. He had a, I think they hired some lady to do some of the work or something like that. Yeah, I know I, I saw some pictures of Clint Jr.'s uh, with the inside of, of uh, the, the clerk and timekeeper's office mm -hmm. and there was a woman there yeah. uh, as a secretary. But 
did uh, Clint Senior then become the the uh, clerk and timekeeper after Bill Bear? Well, uh, I think they had both been timekeepers in different camps okay. or something or other, and and I think that when they consolidated the camps, they were both in the same office. Well, what about medical facilities? Were there anything there? Was there anything there like that? Uh, no, uh, one time, one camp, uh, I think maybe it must have been about the last one. They uh, had a, a nurse. They furnished her a building, and uh, she she was there uh, in case of emergencies, I guess, to get people ready to go into the hospital or command to the doctor. Yeah. Was it she wasn't a doctor; she was a nurse, medical assistant. Well, yeah. Was it was it dangerous working in the work? Oh yes, it really was, especially in the early days, because they didn't have they didn't have these safety people come around them and say you've got to do this and that and they finally got hard hats and then they got uh, um, covers over the cat because they seem to be rather a dangerous thing on account of uh, they couldn't hear and you know if a tree was falling or in a high wind or something they never could hear and uh, several had gotten uh, killed by the, a tree falling on them. Well, they put the cabs over them, and then they were safer. Okay, so, but it was a dangerous place to work. The more I, the away from it, the more I realized how dangerous it was. But <clears throat> a lot of the employees were in their twenties. They were young and healthy, and uh, you know, sharp. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you give me some examples of of the ways that you remember that that folks got injured out there, uh, well, things that come to mind. Mm -hmm. Limb falling out of a tree, and then they were cutting it. And um, well, let's see, what other things? I remember um, a load of logs were being unloaded, and uh, it uh, one of them rolled over. Um, a young fellow, and uh, he, he kind of lost use of his legs. He was more like crippled, but by that he became very strong. Mm -hmm. and, so he continued and, working. Uh, I don't know whether he did or not. Uh, what about the the trains? Trains, locomotives, loads of logs ever get away on the track? They had several wrecks. Uh, one, um, uh, well, probably, well, I don't know if Lee and Cliff told you about this or not, but uh, the, the train uh, got away from them and uh, killed several fellows down here, well, right where Sun River is, only across the river. They came out of the mountains and, and they killed. How they figured got away? Well, I don't know. I suppose they lost their brakes or their pressure or something. And there was a load of logs behind them, you know. It, couldn't, it wouldn't be too hard to do. And then up in the Polinas, there was another wreck of it. And my husband was on that. It was the steel car, I think. And they were, it was the steel laying outfit. Anyway, I remember that <laughs> these big rails all stuck like toothpicks into the dirt. And uh, the, the guys jumped off the train, and when they got to going, they knew it was out of control. <laughs> and the boss of the uh, uh, steel gang was an older fellow, and he, he froze. He couldn't jump. He just didn't want to get off. And they kept telling him to get going, and finally somebody just put their foot up behind him and shoved him out. <laughs> He fell over in the barrel pit, which was soft, and I nice, didn't hurt him. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they had to leave that train. Well, in talking with Lee again, he had mentioned that, you know, it was a dangerous livelihood. And uh, yeah. he seemed to remember, you know, there were times, you know, where somebody was getting hurt or killed on almost a weekly basis. Does it seem well, that regular to you? 
doesn't well not too terribly serious ones um, on the, I was in the post office and whenever they came in that's where they came because the office was there too and uh, uh, if it was a well for instance a head injury and they were bleeding like that they kind of you know, got hit and, you know then somebody would run to the bunkhouse and get a bunch of liquor and uh, <laughs> that, that seemed to be the first uh, treatment that they gave them. Well, they send out the Red Cross uh, people to give, you know, all of us that were close that would be apt to be having any contact with injuries. They gave us first aid, aid classes. And uh, that was the last thing we were taught not to do. <laughs> well, you mentioned, you mentioned liquor. How, what did the company feel about having liquor in the camp? Well, they ignored it. I think more of it. Okay, because again, you know, I, I sometimes have to make comparisons, and a lot of companies didn't like it in the camps because they felt like it contributed too much to accidents. Well, they may have, but I didn't know about it. But, yeah. You know, but uh, the guys would uh, oh, live it up on weekends. You know, mm-hmm. come to town. And, uh, they those that drank would drink. I. I gather, but uh, then quite often uh, Monday uh, they would say, "Well, so and so didn't show up for work. He had the Monday flu, which meant he was having a hangover." <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and that was that was acceptable to the company. Well, I don't know how acceptable it was, but then they probably had replacements and they managed all right without them. But uh, any folks have drinking problems out there? Um, I suppose. But not, I don't know. I don't remember any alcoholics as such. But the the fellows drank beer, more or less, you know, no different than any other place. Right. Any fights? Um, no, not too much. I, You know, uh, in an organization like that, I think they... It, they were pretty careful not to cause any disturbance like that because they would lose their jobs possibly. And people were pretty anxious to hang on to their jobs, you know. So I don't, uh, I don't remember <laughs> very many fights, but I, I think they would have been fired if they had, if they'd caused any, you know very bad trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the most part there was generally a fairly sizable population uh, with numerous buildings out in the middle of the forest and the forest sometimes prone to burning. Uh, did Shevlin Hickson have any policies or procedures to guard and protect his property from fire or you folks to protect it? Uh, did that ever occur? Uh, was there ever any imminent danger from a forest fire? Not when we lived there. Okay. Uh, you, yeah, so there was no uh, imminent danger then? Of, of the no. Um, I Before we moved there, apparently there was a forest fire that came fairly close to camp. And uh, um, I remember people telling me about burying their like a sewing machine or things that they wanted to keep and couldn't carry away out of the range of fire. They thought the fire might get there, but it didn't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> again, because of the, the nature of the structures and, and uh, the, you know, the gas utilities and kerosene, uh, did were there hydrants or anything to, around uh, in the event that a building caught on fire? It just I guess it just seems to me that that the company, uh, recognizing that it had a you know a wooden town uh, and there was certainly lots of chances for open flames and various mm-hmm. utensils, uh, if they'd take measures uh, to offer some sort of protection from, from fire. We didn't have any fire hydrants. We had water hydrants with hoses that I suppose people would use, but 
they had fire trucks that they go out and you know out the woods with, but uh, they never uh, never had to use them in camps that I know of. The uh, big fire, uh, when the uh, light plants and all burned down, they had a, a hoses when they pumped water, because I remember these big streams of water going into the flames. There was plenty of water anyway for that one. <laughs> okay. We, we talked, uh, you know, about Saturday night entertainment and whatnot. When folks came back, when guys came back from the woods and they had their dinner, what did they generally do with their evenings? Well, <clears throat> they usually were going to bed pretty early because they got up early, you know, like 5 o'clock or earlier. And, uh, but uh, there was the, the pool hall, and that's, they go and visit them by cards, you know, just because they're kind of a... Any radio and, programs? Or? Well, at the very beginning, people began getting radios about 1922 or so, and they built their own. And they were, of course, battery run. And they didn't have, they, they had earphones. And if you had a, a set, pretty good set, you could have two earphones. <laughs> two people could listen and if you didn't you could turn one around and somebody put their head up close to it and, and you both would hear it <laughs> it was stereo <laughs> two heads <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and Amos and Andy was very popular and people would um, see who could get a station the farthest away and Cal Gary Canada usually came in pretty well <laughs> And we had air antenna way up in the trees, strung between two trees, and there was a high climber out there that usually would take your uh, aerial off. And then when the time you come to move camp, a lot of people go out and shoot it down, you know. <laughs> well, what about the women? Uh, what You were uh, worked for the Postal Service out there at, at uh, the Pine Camp. Uh, and summer camp. But what did, did other women have jobs that they did out there? Or? No. Uh, now, of course, there was a beautician, and she lived in Fort Rock. She mm -hmm. came up there. But uh, now, Clint's mother had a store and had um, notions and so forth, uh, you know, breads and mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, they had the uh, grocery store at one point, too. And uh, what else was it? I was asking about uh, what the women did with their... Oh, clothes. well, and the, uh, then uh, uh, the waitresses. And they usually, they were usually single ladies. And Where did they stay? Uh, they had their own little house, a company for the a house. And um, let's see, well, that, that was about all. What, there wasn't any jobs. What about the housewives? What did they do during the day? Well, they cleaned out and cooked and sewed. And, <laughs> and really, they, they, I think it was kind of a contest who kept their house the cleanest. And my gosh, they were washing windows once a week and the walls all the time. and. You know. Do you ever any kind of auxiliary clubs or did they get together for coffee? And oh yes, uh, they. Going to Yeah, um, home extension. That's a you know a county thing. Well, Oregon State. <laughs> anyway, they'd come out and we'd have meetings and uh, but. Uh, oh, mom was always home you know, in school. That was the one thing I think that we've lost in the couple here the years going by but mom was always there and dinner was cooking at night you know, when you came in when the dogs came in from work to, to their house well you mentioned meetings what what sort of meetings were there the, well, the, the home the, extension yeah that the, the well, wives would attend well they come out and and uh teach you Oh, we'd have classes, you might say. Well, you know, they were extensions from the college. And this was a way then that 
the women can get together mm -hmm. and socialize. Oh yeah, it only happened now and then though. I mean, it wasn't a once a week thing. I don't know, they came out maybe twice a month or something like that. And yeah, there were, there were card clubs and there was never a lack of something to do really. Mm -hmm. They found their own things. Yeah, I'm just trying to get a picture of of you know the men out and basically out in the woods working and mm -hmm. the wives there and, mm -hmm. and of course they had their domestic chores but yeah. I you know, I guess I I'm trying to get a picture of the other things that they might have done when uh, they felt like their household chores were done that they might get together and do. Oh well, I guess it. Quite often, you know, see the men would leave early in the morning. I think they'd be gone probably about 5.30 or so. And the children were still asleep, not ready to get ready for school yet. So maybe the neighbors would go back and forth and have coffee until time to get the kids ready for school. And, uh, they were, you know, keeping house was... <laughs> kept them pretty busy. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> this is unrelated to, to that, but you mentioned that the, the men would leave. Uh, when they were working out in the woods or whatever, how did they get to where they were working? Well, in the later years, they took them by bus. They had their own little buses. Was that by the Lapine camp? or? Was mm. Well, I think it was before that. Okay. Because they couldn't walk to work. And they were too permanent, and the holdings were farther out. They had to, you know, out in the woods. So how did they get before the buses? How did they get them? Well, when they when they were logging around Bend here, they walked mm -hmm. because, you know, but that didn't last long. They soon had that cut off. Of course, it took longer to cut for than in later years. They mowed it down, you know, and were gone. So did they? When operations were further away from from the camp uh, and before the buses, did did they take a train out or? Well, the, the fellows that worked on the train did the the uh, steel crew, of course. Mm -hmm. They worked on the train. I guess I'm not understanding how how uh, you know say you're at the the cliff camp or what have you. I don't know, maybe there were buses there also. Uh, but in the event that there weren't, if cliff camp were here and operations were over here, how they, the men got from here to there? Well, they were transport them. Okay. By bus. Mm hmm But not the train. I don't, I, well, <clears throat> no, because not necessarily. Uh, I don't, unless they were perhaps falling timber up close to the, where the tracks were, but the loaders were near the track and they dragged the logs in and maybe they could ride out on the train, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, w I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so because their strips that they were cutting, you know, would be spaced along. Mm -hmm. uh, what about vacations? What did folks do, or where did they go, or was there a time, a particular time that uh, was set aside for vacations? Yeah, the camp would close down for probably around Fourth of July, and everybody would take off. Mm -hmm. the camp would be practically deserted. And so it was a company vacation, more or less, a company time. Yeah, the company would allow them. And most generally, people would, surprisingly, the same place. <laughs> for instance, somebody say they were going to Diamond Lake for the forest. You know, well, oh, we think we'll go too. You know, and first thing you know, here you have half the camp all in one area. It was great. It was fun. We'd play baseball, and the guys would fish if they wanted to. And the like at Diamond Lake, they'd have a dance at the lodge, and you know, all kind of horseback riding. They ran horses, and you know, just have a good time. <laughs> Okay. Uh, was were vacations paid by the company, or was it just a week off? I don't know, but I would assume they were paid. I don't know. I can't say that. Okay. Uh, I think that's about all of the questions I have. Are there things that I have missed that you would like to talk about?
<laughs> well, I could talk on forever on, you know, this general life in the camp. That's what I know best, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it, it was a, it was a, not a bad way of life, actually. And uh, um, people got along well. And if you didn't care about your neighbor and the next time you moved, why, well, you just put your name on another lot. One mm-hmm. somewhere, I mean, not next door to them, if you didn't want to live next door to them. Maybe they had a barking dog or so. <laughs> but <coughs> um, the engineers would make a plat of the camp and uh, then you knew you were going to move, so you could look at it and go out there and see where the, the places were for the houses and what the view is, whether you'd want to face the mountain or whatever, mm-hmm. and put your name on it, on the place you want to be. And, uh, was it first come, first served, or was there a seniority? No, no seniority. Anybody could go and wherever you want to live, where well, you could live. And, and friends like to be neighbors and relatives sometimes. Sure. Like with our family, <clears throat> it's all of, um, well, my, my husband had four brothers and his parents, and I had my parents. So, in one camp, we and all were in one little compound. <laughs> you took up a neighborhood in yourself? Yeah, right. Well, and so that was probably, was that customary for other folks to do? Oh, well, I don't know if there were anybody that had as many uh, family as we did. Okay. Uh, but there were uh, 12 cousins in among the group. Yeah. And the guys, they just had their own little group, you yeah. know. So when people say that it was like one big happy family, in some cases it kind of was yes, a really big was. family. Yes, yeah. it was. Okay. It was great. Okay. And really, okay. And if anybody, you know, there were people that maybe they want to go to a concert, say, well, they can go to Portland or wherever they, you know, they weren't deprived, really. They could get wherever they wanted to go. Everybody had a good car and go wherever. <laughs> and uh, my parents took me in the town every week for music lessons and then dancing lessons. My mom used to do Of course, Dad was working all the time. He couldn't take me. My mother didn't know how to dive, so he taught her to dive. So, <laughs> And uh, the the kids had a great time. The, like my brothers, they were always building log cabins or something, you know, kids' things. <laughs> uh, and the kids got along, I think, quite well in the general thing. Well, let me ask you this. Do you think that uh, my recording this information is important? Of course. Because it's something that's going to get lost if we don't, some of us don't get it down in writing somewhere. Because it's like now you, you're, you probably are having a hard time finding any old timers. Because I myself don't know any anymore. They've died off, you know. And probably... Uh, my brothers and I were some of the old timers now. What's left? <laughs> well, uh, speaking of which, can you think of any other folks that I might be able to interview? I, of course, interviewed uh, Clint Jr. Uh-huh. and, and uh, your brother Lee and yourself. I want to speak with Herb and, uh-huh. as I said, uh, uh, Ladessa Walters. Uh-huh. And the amount of time that they spend in a camp doesn't matter. Uh, you know, if they were there for six months or a year, they'll have a, a you know a view. It, it may be very similar to yours, and yet they may have had to leave for reasons that they didn't you know didn't necessarily want to, but something came up somewhere else <laughs> or whatever. But can you think of anybody? Uh, oh, named? I'm so sorry you weren't here sooner. That one of their bosses uh, died just last year, and I intended to talk to him some more because I used to do this too. Mm-hmm. To, you know, interviews of these old timers that I knew, and uh, but my tape recorder went anywhere, so I didn't mm-hmm. get to finish the job. And then it was just, since then, most of them have died. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, no, gosh, I think I can think. Well, of course, Herb and Lee and 
and Junior Olson, um, that's a really sharp guy, so she's not any help. I can't offhand think of anybody. Well, if you do, uh, keep in mind and uh,